comes over. But on the other hand, Hobbes thinks a rational sovereign will, will follow the laws of nature. A rational sovereign will accurately calculate what will, over time, best serve his own self-interest, satisfy his desires. And Hobbes claims that what will best satisfy the desires that a sovereign has will be to have a large and flourishing and rich commonwealth. Yeah, so I think we're on the right track here. Um, look what he says on 131. So, um, paragraph 11, he's repeating that um, it's only through the agreement, and we're talking about sovereignty by acquisition, and he's repeating here that it's only through the agreement, it's only through consent, that sovereignty is extended in this way. I think I read this last time. It's not, it's not therefore the victory that giveth the right of dominion over the vanquished, vanquished but his own covenant. Nor is he obliged because he's conquered, but rather because he cometh in and submitteth to the victor. Nor is the victor, he says, obliged by an enemy's rendering himself, without promise of life, to spare him for his yielding to discretion, which obliges not the victor longer than his own discretion he shall think fit. So the victor, the one who acquires sovereignty by acquisition, is um, not bound in the future at all, but simply is taking on um, his right to decide, his own discretion, what to do with the subject. And therefore, paragraph 12, and therefore, he that hath quarter, he that hath quarter, hath not his life given. So in other words, if you are conquered, and you say, okay, you'll become my sovereign now. I can use my right of nature. You, sorry, I, I'm conquered. You are the sovereign. I transfer my right of nature to you. You don't make any commitment to me, except that you will, in the future, deliberate for yourself about what to do. So, he that hath quarter, hath not his life given to him, but rather deferred till further deliberation. For it is not a yielding on condition of life, but to discretion. And then only, and then only is his life in security and his service due, when the victor hath trusted him with his corporal liberty. For slaves that work in prison or fetters do it not of duty, but rather to avoid the cruelty of their task. So in other words, what happens is that I, when conquered, agree to transfer my right of nature to you for you sparing my life right now. If you spare, you, the sovereign, if you spare my life right now, you have fulfilled your end of the contract. I no longer have a reasonable suspicion about whether you're going to comply or not because you did already. You did make a covenant about future action. You reserved your right to decide for yourself what to do with me in the future. So this is a kind of, well, it's a covenant from my point of view. It's not a covenant from the sovereign's point of view. It's merely a contract. And one that the sovereign fulfills immediately by not killing. Uh, and at the bottom of 131, we get uh, another uh, repetition of the point that sovereignty, whether acquired or instituted, is absolute. It says, for the sovereign is absolute over both alike, or else there is no sovereignty at all. And so every man may lawfully protect himself, if he can, with his own sword, which is the condition of war. So we either have essentially an absolute sovereign, whether acquired or instituted, or no sovereignty at all, because individuals would still be relying on their own judgment, and therefore we would still be in the state of war uh, of all of this. I just want to make sure I got all of this. Yeah. So if I were to join in with the, with the sovereign, I'm saying I will covenant to you that I will be your subject. Yep. 
and the, cut, the sovereign isn't coming to you back. That's right. He's just saying the contractor may be, which is the here and now, is I won't kill you. Right now. Right now. Yeah. So once that's fulfilled, you are his subject. Yeah. And then once the right now is passed, he no longer wants to kill you because having more subjects is serving his best interest. Well, let's hope. Yeah, that's the hope. Okay. Uh, but but if he changes his mind, if he decides to make an example of you, mm -hmm. and that the interest of the Commonwealth would be served best, and therefore his interest would best be served by making an example of you and killing you, and he does, no injustice there. Because you're a subject. Because he has a full right of nature, and you, I mean, you are the author of his action. You're responsible. Yeah, I remember one thing I was also um, the sovereign didn't, the, the one thing he isn't allowed to order is to do is to kill themselves, right? Well, this is what we're about to talk right. about. Okay. <laughs> there, I'll wait. okay, but before we get there, there's just this one more passage I just can't stand not to read to you. So this is on 135. So this is, I mean, so I just read the passage where he says, look, it's absolute sovereignty or nothing. That's the choice that we have. And somebody might say, this is on 135, I follow your reasoning, Hobbes, but the fact of the matter is, uh, in the world today, we don't have this kind of absolute, unconditional sovereignty. And here's, here's his reply. He says, the greatest objection is that of the practice when men ask where and when such power has by subjects been acknowledged. In the real world, it ain't like that, Hobbes. But one may ask them again, when or where has there been a kingdom long free from sedition and civil war? In those nations whose commonwealths have been long lived, and not been destroyed by, but by far more, the subject never did dispute of the sovereign power. But howsoever an argument from the practice of men that have not sifted to the bottom and with exact reason weighed the causes and nature of commonwealth and suffered daily those miseries that proceed from the ignorance thereof is invalid. So uh, unless we actually reason through and get to the bottom of this, there's no objection here at all. For though in all places of the world men should lay the foundation of their houses on sand, it could not thence be inferred that it ought to be so. The skill of, maintaining, of making and maintaining commonwealths consists in certain rules. Rules of reason, the laws of nature. As doth arithmetic and geometry, not as tennis play on practice only. So these aren't arbitrary rules that we can make up and change. We can't change the laws of nature like we can change the rules of tennis. These are established by reason. And if people don't, in fact, follow them, so much the worse for those societies. So much the worse for the stability of actual economies. OK, now on to chapter 21, where Hobbes is talking about um, the liberty of the subject. And there's this one thread hanging out of Hobbes' argument that has not been tied up. And a couple people have alluded to it. First, note what he says about liberty. So liberty, you remember, is the absence of external impediments. And so liberty can describe anything that doesn't have external impediments. Anything can be at liberty, anything can have liberty if there are not external impediments. Um, including living and non-living things, he says. So liberty and necessity, causal necessity, for Hobbes are compatible. Um, and this is what he's saying uh, over on uh, 136. Actually, the, uh, over on 136. Liberty and necessity are consistent, he says, as in the water that hath not only the liberty, but a necessity of descending by the channel. 
Okay, so the water flowing through a river is not constrained by external impediments, so it has liberty. But of course, it's, ca it's, it's caused by gravity to fall through that channel. And so its path is determined. So this isn't a surprise because Hobbes is a materialist and a mechanist. All of our emotions are determined by some cause, including our desires, which you remember are just small motions of our nervous system through our brain. And our will, you remember, is just the last of those before the desire is outwardly expressed. So to have a will just means to have desires that are outwardly expressed, that cause our actions, and when there are no external impediments on that, then we have acted free them. Okay. But there are also, in addition to the channels that uh, the river flows down, which are natural uh, limits um, on the liberty of the water to go in a different direction. There are also artificial bonds which limit liberty. And these, of course, and these, of course, are covenants. So covenants are artificial bonds that limit our liberty. They're artificial because these are things that we create, we establish. Um, that's what we're saying at the top of one day. Liberty, the sovereign power of life and death, is either abolished or limited. Um, for it is already shown that nothing the sovereign representative can do to a subject on what pretense whatsoever can properly be called injustice or injury, because every subject is author to every act the sovereign doth, so that he never wanted right to anything. The sovereign can do anything that he wants to know. Um, worry about violating covenant. Okay, over on 141, then, I want you to note, then, um, the following key passage, which should not come as a surprise to you here. So now he's going to talk about the liberty that subjects have. To come now to the particulars of the true liberty of a subject, that's to say, what are the things which, though commanded by the sovereign, he may nevertheless, without injustice, refuse to do. So now our question is whether subjects have any liberty against the sovereign. That's our question. And he says, to answer this, we're to consider the ways that, um, the ways, sorry, we are to consider what rights we pass away when we make a commonwealth or, which is all one, what liberty we deny ourselves by owning all the actions of the man or assembly we make our sovereign. For in the action of our submission consisteth both our obligation and our liberty, which must therefore be inferred by arguments taken from there. There being, here's the key, there being no obligation on any man which ariseth not from some act of his own. For all men equally are by nature free. So we call this, well, this is our question, sorry, liberty of subjects against the sovereign. And we can call what I just read voluntarism. Voluntarism says that there are no, this is voluntarism about morality. 